Austrian American management consultant, educator, and author Peter Drucker once said, What gets measured gets improved. All right, so let's start talking about measuring the supply chain, shall we? <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 490 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Yes, my friends, we're talking about one of the hottest topics in all of EE this week, the new James Webb Telescope. Okay, actually, no, but you'd think I was producing a whole podcast series based on the amount of time that I've looked at those photos this week. <laughs> so, no, actually, Daniel Schoenfelder from Altium is joining me this week to discuss the Eddy Report, how it can help you with your next design, and what it can tell us about the supply chain as it stands today compared to what it was before. Also this week, I take a closer look at new research from the U.S. Department of Energy's Argonne National Laboratory that shows that machine learning algorithms can predict how long a lithium-ion battery will last. All right, without further ado, let's welcome Daniel to Fish Fry. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thanks for having me, Amelia. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So you guys recently announced the addition of the industry demand index to the Spectra Electronic Design to Delivery Index report. All right. So let's unravel that a bit. For my audience who may not know, talk to me a little bit about Spectra. Sure. That sounds great. It is a real mouthful. So we'll do our best to unravel this throughout our chat today. Spectra is a brand under which we go to market with our business intelligence suite of products. And that business intelligence is derived from a number of different places. But one of the ones that's really unique to us is that the company that I work for, Altium, it sits at the intersection of a really great part in the electronics industry in that we are at the center of both design with the Altium designer product that we have that's a premier EDA suite for printed circuit board design. We have Octopart, which is a search engine that gets somewhere north of 6 million unique visitors per month that are searching for electronic components. And we also have our Nexar API that gets uh, approximately 15 million calls per week to the API. And so with all these user experiences that we power, we have this great loop of feedback of what is being designed into new products, of what is being searched for electronic components, about what is available electronic componentry look like in the market. And what we're doing with our Spectra suite of products is taking those user insights, packaging up in ways that decisions can be made by businesses that are stakeholders across the spectrum of electronic components uh, realization process. We kind of tend to divide things up into three domains for us, the design domain, the supply chain domain, in the manufacturing domain. And these data sets we're working with from Spectra really span those domains and kind of bring them closer together. Okay, so let's dig into the details of this EDI report. What kind of information does it provide? Sure, there are two primary signals that are in the report today. And those signals are one for demand and one for supply. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of them. From the demand perspective, what we're really trying to allow users to, to understand and stakeholders to understand is how difficult will sourcing for various product categories be? We look at nine high-level categories and then about 15 sub-level categories. So whether you want to learn more about passive componentry or if you'd like to see more about integrated circuits or dive a little bit deeper into things like microcontrollers and discretes, these are things that are all represented in the report. And that demand signal is one that has been extremely wild over the last couple of years. Our indexes are tied to January of 2020. It's pre-pandemic and intentional that way because I think it's the closest thing to, that any of us remember to being normal. When you're looking, regardless if you're looking at the demand index or the supply indexes, you're going to get something that's compared to January of 2020. And the reports themselves have 24 months of history in them. So you get a rich 
time series view of what has happened over the last two years for both that demand and the supply signal. And uh, do you mind if I dive into the supply signal quickly and just give a few words on that? Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and so the supply signal is really looking at what is publicly available inventory at a category level. So again, we're dividing it by semiconductor products and passives and circuit protection is another high level category. Connectors is another. The supply is looking at what is publicly available and how does that compare again to a baseline of January, 2020. And so as you can imagine, there are some commodity categories right now where Sourcing products is very difficult, and it's primarily because publicly available inventory or off-the-shelf inventory just does not exist. For example, I think it's the microcontroller category where we've seen about 20 consecutive months of decline of supply, which is really a remarkable stat if you think about it. It just speaks to how much the manufacturers of 8, 16, 32-bit microcontrollers are having a hard time getting any inventory into the channel that can be publicly available for purchase. Obviously, it impacts businesses and their revenue predictability, but it also impacts the designer. It impacts the engineer that's trying to source for prototype builds as well, too. So we feel that these supply and demand signals have a nice interplay between the two of them that give a very representative feel of what it can be experienced right now in the market, but also how does that compare with last month or 12 months ago or 24 months ago. That makes sense. Now, the industry supply index is part of the eddy, right? That is correct. Yeah. Tell me more about that as well. Yeah. So the industry supply index is the supply index that we were referring to just a few minutes ago. We have extremely rich history in our business of where has inventory gone over the last 10 years. And we're choosing to, as part of this eddy report, to make a couple years of that history kind of available to the market and do so in a free fashion where I don't think we've touched upon this yet in the conversation, but the Yeti report is available for free. It's something where if you go to nexar.com, there is a place where you can register to receive a PDF in your inbox on a monthly basis and get that update. And we're getting prepared to publish our May end results here now in the next couple of days. Okay, so Dan, besides getting the monthly report into their inboxes, how can engineers and businesses utilize the EDI? Yeah, I think the beauty of the EDDI report is that it provides a kind of a lens through which people can look at high-level risk and then drill down into specific part numbers or categories that are important to them. We have nine high-level categories and then subcategories below that. So it represents around 25 different commodity categories. However, we track about 300. So one of the benefits to businesses is they can use the free report as an indicator for where the market is headed. And then they can work on a one-on-one basis with us as a business to cater a report that drills down to the categories they're concerned about or their specific bill of materials as well. So we think that the Eddy is just a great way to keep your finger on the pulse of market conditions. But there are other solutions beyond the Eddy where we can go into much greater detail. That makes sense. All right, Dan, I think it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, since you haven't been on my show before, I'm going to throw you my standard off-the-cuff. <laughs> so a lot of us can't get our favorite foods these days for one reason or another. We can't fly to another country. The restaurant's closed. Any number of reasons. So, Dan, if you could have one meal right now, what would it be? <laughs> One meal right now. This, this is an easy one for me. So I'm based in Denver, Colorado, but I grew up in central New York state outside of Rochester, New York. And there is a uh, company that makes hot dogs there called Zweigel's. And one of their specialties is a white hot dog. And since we're on the cusp of summer here, uh, I think it's hot dog season. And I would love to have a Zweigel's white hot dog right now in front of me. I love that. Now, what makes the white hot dog different from other regular hot dogs? You know, Amelia, I'm not sure any of us want to get into more detail into what makes a hot dog. It might be a frightening discussion. Um, I I believe it's it's true. I believe it's pork um, is is primarily what it is. Um, And and that's as far as I'd like to take that that answer. So. (laughs) Absolutely understandable. Yeah. Enough about hot dogs. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dan, this was awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, Amelia, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. 
How many times have you replaced a lithium ion battery just to have it die within a week or less? But what if machine learning could help us better understand the lifespan of these kind of batteries? Well, this is exactly what is at the center of a new research project that recently took place at the U.S. Department of Energy's Argonne National Laboratory. So, this team used 300 batteries that used six different battery chemistries as the basis of their research. And then they trained a specific machine learning algorithm using an initial set of data from those batteries. Argonne computational scientist Noah Paulson, who is also the author of this study, explains the process like this. He says... For every different kind of battery application, from cell phones to electric vehicles to grid storage, battery lifetime is of fundamental importance for every consumer. Having to cycle a battery thousands of times until it fails can take years. Our method creates a kind of computational test kitchen where we can quickly establish how different batteries are going to perform. So, this study was actually built on some battery experimentation at this lab. This team has worked extensively on a variety of battery cathode materials, including Argonne's patented nickel-manganese cobalt-based cathode. And this previous work was quite valuable to this machine learning research because it gave these researchers an understanding of the different characteristics about how specific batteries perform. So, will this new machine learning algorithm help us build better batteries in the future? This team from the Argonne National Laboratory thinks so. Noah Paulson says this about the future of this technology. One of the things we're able to do is train the algorithm on a known chemistry and have it make predictions on an unknown chemistry. Essentially, the algorithm may help us point in the direction of new and improved chemistries that offer longer lifetimes. And I, for one, am all for it. So, if you want even more information about this powerful new study, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page on eejournal.com, including the associated research paper called Feature Engineering for Machine Learning Enabled Early Prediction of Battery Lifetime. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. (laughs) And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of July 15th, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>